welcome to um, our next webinar, uh, one that we're really, really excited about. Um, so, uh, Vic, very big hearty welcome on, on this, what's turning into be an autumn day. You can see all the leaves are coming down. Um, so, today we're going to talk a little bit about the 5G economy. Um, for those that know anything about the Digital Council and previously the FTTX Council, it's a topic um, that we've, uh, you know, had a lot of conversations about historically, and we've spoken about this extensively over the last um, five years at least. Um, so, and, and everybody knows that, you know, we always talk about, you know, the 5G um, economy. Um, and in the past, we focused a lot on, you know, the role of fiber in achieving 5G. Um, and we've always said that, you know, mobile networks are not so, so wireless anymore. You know, there's going to be a lot of wires. And, and the Digital Council Africa really believes that, you know, the, that 5G um, poses enormous economic benefits to the country. Um, and especially post-COVID, you know, we, we're coming out of a phase now where we're looking to achieving, um, you know, economic recovery. Um, and in, in our uh, opinion, we believe that um, the ICT sector as a whole and telecommunications is going to be one of those areas where we're going to see tremendous growth. And, and certainly, I think we've already seen that. I think, you know, since the advent of COVID-19, um, we've seen uh, uptake, you know, increase dramatically. The demand for digital services, a demand for digital transformation has increased dramatically. Um, and I think that we can expect that to increase as we, as we go forward. Um, so throughout 2021, we're actually going to have a series of events that's going to focus on 5G. And um, we think it's important that, you know, as a continent, we understand the potential benefits of 5G um, and, um, and also what it is that we need to do to achieve um, 5G. So today is the first in a series of, um, of 5G uh, initiatives or webinars that we're launching. Later this year, um, we're going to, with one of our members, um, get involved in, in a six-week um, extensive 5G training course where we will invite um, everybody to join us weekly to participate in that and to um, support us. Um, and and to, to, you know, so, so we can support you as well to really understand. It's like a 5G uh, 101 uh, course to take you through, um, you know, through the, the technology as a whole. Um, and I think um, what's important for us is that we all embrace the technology. We know that it's had a lot of negative publicity. We are very and deeply concerned about that. Um, as an industry association, we're doing... Um, extensive work and we're busy with um, animation and video clips uh, that we are designing to um, that we will distribute to uh, all of you the, it'll eventually be translated into all official languages um, trying to educate people on the value of uh, next generation mobile communications um, and I think one of the things that we have to accept is um, and this is something you know that, that we've always been, um, you know, sort of very much in favor of is that uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago this year, when the, what was then known as the, the Fiber to the Home Council was started, uh, you know, we got a lot of um, sort of criticism uh, saying this is the mobile continent and why are you guys talking about fiber and Africa is not ready for fiber. And at the time, we just put shoulder to the wheel, we buckled down because we stood for something we firmly believed in. At the time, we said that, um, you know, this is a technology that's coming. This is something that's going to happen. And Africa needs to make a decision. We can either be a part of it or we are going to be left behind because make no mistake, this is a direction that globally. Um, the world is taking. And it's very much the same for 5G. You know, whether we believe it, whether we adopt it, whether we take it, whether we put measures in place, whether we remove obstacles to deployment, what we have to be very clear on is this is where the rest of the world is going. And we can choose to go along and or we can choose to be left behind. So globally, there's a move towards adopting higher broadband speeds. There's a move towards adopting work from home policies. And I think the world is changing 
and we can stand on the side and criticize it, or we can become part of this and stay informed and be a part of it. So whether we do it or don't do it, our job today here is to bring you some information around the 5G economy so that you can ultimately make up your own mind. So without further ado, it's a big pleasure for me to now um, introduce our speakers. Um, but just before we do that, just a little bit of housekeeping. So please, uh, you know, do us a favor and introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, give us the names of um, people that are on the call. It's always nice to share that information um, with you and, um, and with everybody else. It's nice to know who's joined us. Um, and then this morning, our first speaker that's joining us is somebody that needs very little introduction. Dobek Parter um, is uh, with Africa Analysis. He's been with them for over 20 years. Um, everybody knows the work that Africa uh, Analysis does. Um, you know, they does ex they've done extensive research um, for both the Digital Council Africa um, and they work across Sub-Saharan Africa. So they've got a tremendous knowledge of the ICT sector in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and we've got a long-standing relationship with them. We've worked very closely with them. Um, and um, again, this year, they delivered a report, which um, you know we, we feel is really important, uh, looking at the 5G economy and understanding its potential. And um, um, like all analysis and, and market forecasters, uh, are often uh, think that they, they're slightly conservative um, and um, we're a little bit more bullish. But um, I think it's quite um, important for, for both sides um, of the fence to be heard. But um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, uh, Dobek, um, welcome and thank you very much for, uh, for sharing uh, some of your time with us this morning to talk to us about. Um, you know, how you see the 5G economy um, and sharing some of the research that, uh, that you've done. Um, and then just um, as Dobik uh, brings himself online, I just want to point out that um, the work that Dobik is sharing this morning um, is research that is available for purchase. Um, it is directly available from Africa Analysis. So Dobik is going to uh, present an extract out of that research for us this morning. Um, which he will share with us, but um, uh, Risha will in the chat post his contact details. You're welcome to approach him. Uh, he will give you a little bit more information at the end of his presentation about this research that they have conducted. Um, and um, the Digital Council obtained a copy and, and uh, we found it really interesting uh, to, to look at that. Um, unfortunately, it's not something that we can share with our members, but um, you're all welcome to contact him and, and obtain a copy. And then, yeah, please introduce yourself in the in the chat. And any questions you may have for Dobek, please post it in the chat as well. And then um, you can just post it as we go along during the morning. Risha will keep track of those questions and then um, make sure that um, you know we answer all of those questions before we move into our next session. Welcome, Dobek. Thank you very much for joining us, and um, thanks for your time. Thank you, Juanita, and for the starting introduction and. And let me just share the screen um, and so that uh, we can actually speak about what we want to speak about this morning, uh, which is the outlook of 5G market in South Africa. We're trying to bring it into presentation mode. Okay. That's better. I hope everyone can see it's visible. Um, so again, thanks very much for the introductions. And as you want to indicate it, I'm going to uh, provide an overview of um, the expected market evolution of 5G in South Africa over the next few several years. And it's based on a report we published in February. Um, once the um, the, the high demand spectrum auction and awarding of the Warren license takes place, um, hopefully soon. Uh, we are going to do an update to this report um, because there, there probably will be some changes and some of those due to the delayed auction that's, um, that everyone's waiting for to take place and, and obviously the Warren as well. And as Siwanita indicated, uh, the report is available uh, for purchase from Africa Analysis. And um, so we're going to look at the, the background and as far as the mobile market in South Africa is concerned briefly, 
uh, the high demand spectrum auction timeline uh, than the current 5G market. We've had 5G in South Africa for um, over a year now. Um, we, we're starting with Rain as the first operator and service provider. And then look at the opportunity in, in, in the 5G market. That's from a, a market growth perspective and uh, use cases. And yes, there is a, an element of fiber in there, uh, and that's the back hole, front hole opportunity. Um, so if we look at the, uh, the 5G market uh, or the, the, the mobile market, per se in South Africa, um, from a historical evolution perspective, uh, it's, uh, we do see South Africa being at the forefront um, globally as an adapter, adopter of, of technologies in the mobile space. So you look at the graphic on the right-hand side, um, across all the generation of mobile technologies from 2G all the way to 5G, we see that South Africa is in the top 10% of um, countries globally where operators start to deploy the new technologies and introduce them into the market and commercialize them early on. Um, so within, within the first 10% of deployments that take place globally. And that's one of the uh, advantages in South Africa as far as uh, introduction and um, commercial use of new technologies is uh, concerned and uptake of those services that they enable. Um, and that's a, a key point that's important because as Juanita mentioned, we do expect as well 5G to play a critical role in enabling the new economy and, and uh, also recovery from uh, COVID-19 lockdown um, and the damage it's, it's caused to our economy. Um, and the quicker we can deploy 5G infrastructure and see the uptake of those services, uh, the, the more important it is for the country as a whole. And it is going to play a, a significant role in the fourth industrial revolution that the South African government um, places so much emphasis on and has been doing that for the past couple of years. I think another element of the South African mobile market that's, that's also important is that even in the face of adversity, such as we, we've been facing now, a uh, dearth of available spectrum, high demand spectrum, which would enable uh, quicker um, 5G deployment and also augmentation of 4G services. Uh, operators are able to overcome those to a large extent and actually deploy new technologies in spite of the fact uh, of the constraints that they face. And we've seen that with 4G deployment in South Africa, where um, a large portion of spectrum used for 3G services had been refarmed by operators in order to be able to offer better quality 4G. And also in the case of 5G, um, effectively three operators have launched um, commercial retail services by now, uh, Rain, MT, and Vodacom. And th th that's been enabled through partially through strategic roaming agreements or effectively spectrum sharing agreements between operators in the market. Uh, and also some of the temporary spectrum that was assigned by ICASA uh, to counter the uh, enable communications and staying in touch and being online during the lockdown, um, particularly the strict lockdown uh, period of time last year. Also, if you look at this slide, it speaks to, to what Ioannita mentioned, and that's uh, the demand for data services, for online services. Um, on the left-hand side, we see that uh, data has been growing at 67% on average year on year, CAGR, over the past five years, data, data consumption growth um, in the market. That's by consumers and by the business sector. Uh, and that's significant growth. And if we look at uh, 2020 in particular, uh, that's 73% growth, um, which just speaks to the fact that uh, the, the need to stay in touch and uh, continue to use online services with, for daily activities uh, grew exponentially uh, when in, in, during the lockdown scenario when people stayed at home and they still had to continue to work, educate themselves, continue to entertain themselves, uh, stay in touch with each other. Um, and, and this just represents mobile data. Um, so just, just an illustration of growth. At the same time, um, we see that revenue growth, which only... Um, so that 9.5% for 2020 has been significantly lower year on year um, as far as CAGR is concerned over the past five years. And that effectively indicates that uh, the price of data connectivity for data uh, itself has been decreasing significantly in South Africa over the past several years. And in fact, 
uh, it is already fairly low and it's becoming lower as we saw a few days ago with Vodacom again announcing further price reductions on uh, various data packages they offer uh, as part of the agreement they signed with the competition commission. So even though data consumption is growing uh, very strongly year on year, uh, that's not necessarily matched in terms of revenue growth for the operators um, as far as uh, year on year growth is concerned. Um, if we look at the, um, the timeline of issuing of the additional spectrum, that's a bit of a busy slide here, uh, but the additional high demand spectrum that the market is expecting to see released to operators and also to the wireless open access network operator um, is significant in terms of enablement of uh, not only enhancement of 4G services so that it can uh, everyone in the country can enjoy better quality 4G services irrespective of where they are geographically, but also um, growth in deployment of 5G infrastructure, commercial, commercialization of these services, and ability of increasingly broader segments of the society and the business sector to start using 5G as the underlying infrastructure for increasingly more sophisticated and data-hungry services applications in that, that are available in the country. Um, so initially, we expected that the auction would have been concluded um, at the end of March this year, so effectively a week ago. Uh, the Warren um, license applications were also due at the end of March. Unfortunately, uh, there have been two legal challenges from Telcom and MTN to the um, to, to this, uh, the, the auction process, uh, the high demand spectrum auction process, which need to be resolved before that auction can take place. We don't know how long that's going to play, uh, take place. Hopefully, you know, it's a matter of, uh, say, several weeks to a few months rather than over a year in order to resolve that impasse. And that's going to have a, a delayed effect on the assignment of the spectrum, uh, conclusion of the auction assignment of the spectrum, and actually use of that spectrum to deliver commercial services once networks have been built using that spectrum. And if if we stuck to the original timeline, so auction was concluded in March, um, spectrum licenses would have been assigned within the next few to several weeks following the auction process. We would have expected the, the, the operators that gained through additional spectrum through the auction to launch commercial services on the basis of that spectrum before the end of this year. So probably later in quarter three into quarter four of this year. Uh, similarly, with the Warren license, once the license and, and the accompanying spectrum license or licenses have been assigned, uh, we would have expected to see the Warren probably launch uh, sometime during first half of next year. Um, we do take certain delays into account, uh, slippage in, in the timeline. Um, Warren does have a period of two years before they actually have to start offering um, commercial services on their own infrastructure. So, and, and seven years until they need to use all of the spectrum that ultimately will be assigned to it. Uh, so they have a bit more time, but we expect them to probably start sooner rather than later to, to, um, to, to use that spectrum and deploy the network. Uh, so we probably would have seen the, the large commercial operators in the market uh, have a bit of a, a lead in the market, uh, maybe six months um, first to market advantage in, in the use of the, the new high demand spectrum assigned to them um, as far as commercial services are concerned. Um, now that's that's going to take probably another um, a couple few months longer now that, uh, that we have the, the delay introduced into the process. Another delay, unfortunately, we're facing is in the uh, sub one gigahertz spectrum frequencies. And that's the 700, 800 frequency still used by some of the broadcasters and the Department of Communications indicated that they have again uh, postponed the release of that spectrum. Um, uh, the, the broadcasters now only have to vacate that spectrum ultimately in March next year as opposed to June this year. Um, we don't expect that, that will necessarily introduce a lot of delay into uh, the, the, the use of that spectrum by operators, uh, but it may have a bit of a introduce a bit of a slippage nonetheless. Hopefully it's the last delay that we are going to experience in terms of you now definitively vacating of that spectrum by the broadcasters. Uh, so that's broadly the timeline. 
um, that we expect to see um, unfolding over the next year to two years um, as far as the high demand spectrum assignment is concerned. And if you look in the upper right side, uh, sorry, left side, my side of, of the screen, um, there will be four spectrum brand, uh, bands that will be, they will see spectrum released uh, assigned to operators for 4G and 5G services. Uh, that's in the 700, 800 megahertz, um, and then the mid band 2600 megahertz and 3500 megahertz. And out of those, we expect the 3500 megahertz to be the, the choice spectrum, so to speak, for operators to build 5G infrastructure. We'll see some of the, the lower frequencies, um, sub one gigahertz frequencies being used as well. Um, MTN has started to pilot some of its uh, network, 5G network in those frequencies, but uh, the brunt will be, the focus will be on the 3.5 gigahertz initially. Uh, if we look at the current 5G market, we um, the, the market, as, as said, has been in existence for over, over a year now, with um, RAIN initially offering 5G services in late 2019. We now have three operators offering commercial services, and that's RAIN, and then followed by Vodacom and MTN, both of uh, the, the larger operators started to offer services uh, roughly midway through 2020 last year. Um, and then we also have a fourth player in the market, Liquid Telecom, which um, is one of those operators that um, has decided to use its spectrum that it has available to build a wholesale, start building a wholesale 5G network and then in that and make it available to retail service providers. In that respect, Liquid Telecom uh, effectively is becoming a, a direct competitor to the Warren. Um, which also will be a wholesale operator offering um, service providers 4G, 5G services. Um, the, the spectrum that will be released is technology neutral. Licenses are technology neutral in the South African um, the regulatory regime. So the operators will be free to decide whether they use that spectrum for 4G deployment um, or 5G deployment. Um, and we expect both to take place. Um, however, increasingly, we do expect them to start focusing on 5G services um, as they've already started moving in that direction. Um, from a availability of 5G currently, uh, this is looking at the end of 2020. Um, we calculated a, an approximate population coverage of 4.4% um, on 5G infrastructure using 1,176 sites um, and about 90,000 active SIM cards in the market at the end of 2020. Uh, to achieve that coverage, uh, various spectrum has been used by the different operators. Uh, some of it is the emergency spectrum issued by ICASA uh, to counter the, the lockdown effects of having to stay at home and still carry on with, let's say, relatively normal life. Uh, that spectrum is uh, due back to ICAS at the end of May uh, in a couple of months um, uh, on an extended timeline. Um, operators that wish to retain that spectrum um, will need to pay spectrum fees, and that spectrum will also be part of the, of the auction process. Um, what we see on the right-hand side is an index of devices, number of devices in the 4G, environment versus the 5G environment. And effectively, what we're trying to illustrate here is that uh, there has been a lot of support from the OEMs for 5G devices globally. Uh, what the graphic indicates is the, the, the number of 5G devices available globally in the year of um, the, the mobile service. So 4G servers versus the 5G service. And if we look at year two, so effectively in, in uh, year two of the commercial availability of 5G services globally, we already saw an excess of 500 5G devices being available from the OEMs. That's versus 269 devices in the 4G environment at the same period of time of 4G evolution globally. Um, that, that has an, a number of implications. Uh, one is that um, the availability of and accessibility of 5G will be far greater because of the different, the, the, just the number of devices and the quantity 
devices ultimately will be produced by the manufacturers. And so 5G should not see really many constraints in, in from a device perspective in users wanting to access 5G services. With more devices and OEMs focusing so strongly on 5G devices, we also expect price competition to be stronger, which means that ultimately affordability will be greater over a shorter period of time. So again, the, the access to the 5G environment and the ecosystem should be uh, quicker and easier than it was in the 4G environment initially. A um, third point to make is that what we observed historically from historical analysis in the, in the, in the South African market, uh, when through the evolution of the different mobile technologies, is that devices play a, a more important role than network population coverage uh, in the mobile space. So effectively, uh, we see greater, we've seen greater adoption of new servers based on greater availability of devices rather than greater network coverage. So even though 5G is not going to achieve 95% population coverage within the next few years to match 4G coverage, um, it is likely to see strong adoption based on the fact that a lot of devices are already available and will be available over the next few years floating in the market at reasonable prices. Um, having spoken of devices, at the moment, what we do witness is a premium placed on 5G services. And we do expect that same scenario happened in, with 4G in South Africa when it was initially offered um, by Vodacom and MTN. Uh, they charge premiums on 4G services versus 3G services that didn't last very long as soon as 4G started uh, realizing a, a broader population coverage uh, prices across the different technology or different generation products were equalized. So you, you pay effectively for the same the same price for the for the service, whether you happen to be on a 4G network or a 3G network. Uh, but at the moment, th there is uh, sometimes significant difference in 5G services versus 4G. Uh, having said that, we see that uh, sort of the top end Vodacom product is actually a bit less costly in using 5G technology than the comparable 4G product. Uh, but in general, uh, price premium goes all the way up to 100% on some of the lower end products. Um, and, and granted, we, we do expect that with, with new technologies being introduced into the market, that they are effectively a, a premium technology, premium product initially, uh, before things begin to, to equalize. Now, if we look at uh, growth opportunity, um, this is just a, a slide that we, you can read at, at your leisure. Uh, summarizing um, drivers of 5G coverage that we expect in the market, and it's a combination of spectrum license obligations for 4G, 5G deployment uh, through the, the current spectrum uh, assignment process, and also commercial demand for 5G services, which is going to grow. Uh, based on our analysis, um, we expect 5G population coverage to reach an excess of 43% by the end of 2025. So over a period of five years, effectively growing from under 5% to well in excess of 40% population coverage. And uh, so that's quite significant. Also bearing in mind that South Africa is increasingly a, an urbanized environment with an excess of 60% of the population li living in urban areas. Um, and as far as 5G is concerned, that's where we expect to, to see uh, the, focus, uh, the, the focus to be in network deployment mostly in the urban environment and then into peri-urban. Um, so uh, that population coverage is going to expand quite quickly. And um, we, we also have seen statements from um, operators such as MTN, for instance, indicating that once they actually have access to the so-called 5G spectrum, they will expand their coverage up to 16% of the population within year one of network deployment. So that's it's very rapid expansion and quick growth. And also it goes with it, significant continued investment, CapEx into this infrastructure. Uh, what we then also expect to see is growth in subscriber numbers or active SIMs um, across different um, devices, across different spectrum bands. Um, and we anticipate that by the end of 2025, we'll see an excess of 11 million active SIM cards on the 5G networks, and that's that's a growth from 
about, about 90,000 at the end of 2020. So again, exponential growth, both in coverage and then correspond, correspondingly in, in uptake of those services, uh, which will be also be, will be supported by um, two things. One, one is the, the device availability, and secondly, also the continued decrease of data prices in the South African market that we expect to see. Uh, driven by competition, but all uh, uh, is in competitive environment, but also by the, uh, the the government almost in let's say insistence on decreasing prices in the market to uh, create greater affordability and ability to use those services by uh, the ultimately the entire population of South Africa. And. Um, this speaks to infrastructure de deployment um, in the 5G space in South Africa. Um, so we, one, of, one of the characteristics of 5G is um, greater densification of sites, of the infrastructure. And that also depends on, obviously, on which spectrum bands are being used. Um, this is based purely on the 3.5 gigahertz spectrum band. But when we start looking at the high band, uh, high frequencies, the uh, millimeter wave type applications, that densification will uh, grow by significantly by orders of magnitude compared in, in terms of sites compared to 3.5 gigahertz. And, and also conversely, once the sub one gigahertz frequencies are starting to be used extensively for 5G, we'll see a uh, requirement for, for fewer sites in that spectrum and, and lower densification. Uh, but purely based on the so the, the, the 3.5 gigahertz, which effectively supports the um, extensive mobile broadband or the high, very high speed mobile broadband applications, uh, that, that will be the, the initial focus of the service providers. Um, we see the number of sites growing to 30,000 over the next five years. So very quick growth of sites in comparison to what we've seen historically uh, with the, in the 3G environment and then also subsequently the 4G environment. And, and that's going to ultimately present an opportunity uh, for fiber operators. And that's in the fiber to the site or for the backhaul, front haul applications in order to backhaul all that traffic. As we saw on one of the initial slides, um, data growth has been very strong year on year, data consumption. And we expect that consumption pattern to continue into the future. Um, and that just translates into a lot of traffic being generated from the users and um, both consumer and business. And obviously that requires um, very good quality, high throughput infrastructure in order to, to backhaul that data to aggregation points. Um, so the, the, the fiber to the site opportunity for additional fiber links is going to grow also considerably. Uh, what the slide on the right-hand side represents is additional FTTS link requirements annually. Uh, now we see that that only really starts to pick up in 2024, which is a, a few years from now. Um, we expect that 5G infrastructure deployment will take place initially within the existing fiber footprint. So there's a lot of fiber in place already um, that can service the, the 5G environment. We're also going to see, um, as we see on this slide, we're going to see um, certain factors that will um, inhibit, so to speak, um, greater requirement for a, for FTTS, uh, and that has to do with increasing sharing of sites um, and ultimately also moving into sharing of, of the radioactive network and also um, ultimately moving into buying of bandwidth by operators on the backhaul fiber links rather than buying dark fiber and actually lighting up their own services. So we'll see a lower requirement for fiber, uh, just dark fiber links to sites and move more towards um, active fiber usage for backhaul. Uh, but as, as the densification of 5G sites grows, then more and more fiber will have to be also put into the ground or into the air to service those front hall and backhaul requirements. Um, if we look at uh, further opportunities and um, look at use cases, and those are the, the last couple of slides, so I can stick to roughly to my 30 minutes. Um, there will be use cases in the consumer residential space and also in the, say the, 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 the business 
commercial space, uh, which initially will be the driver of 5G usage um, and variety of, of use cases. Um, if we first look at the consumer environment, we effectively are looking at um, broadly three use cases, uh, use case types for the, uh, and predominantly for the home environment. We expect that a lot of the initial usage will be in the fixed wireless type scenario. So effectively we have, uh, we'll be seeing with fixed LTE currently um, growing quite significantly in the South African market. Uh, we're also going to start seeing expansion of 5G usage uh, in, in a fixed type environment. So in the home rather than full mobility uh, services on the phone uh, as, a, as a smart phone, smart uh, pocket device, uh, MiFi type devices, uh, although that's going to grow in time as well. Uh, the, the initial use case and probably most broadly used is going to be the enhanced mobile broadband. So that's the effectively high broadband uh, to be able to, or high speed broadband to be able to access a variety of work, um, education and entertainment related services. Increasingly that will also translate into expansion of and usage of e-government services. Um, and, and with that uh, mentioned education, but also e-health, e uh, including mobile health services. Uh, the next two use cases um, are around uh, gaming, and that could be cloud-based gaming or collaborative gaming. Um, we see the market for that fairly limited in South Africa. It is limited predominantly to, let's say, the, the, the middle and even upper middle class uh, within the South African society, and all of those homes do already have fiber connected to them. So there will be limited requirement to have 5G services uh, used for that unless they happen to, to be, uh, be offering better services in a, in a particular geographic setting than fiber, uh, which is probably difficult to achieve even with 5G. Um, and then sort of the, the smart home, uh, IoT home, um, scenario where effectively we're going to be moving into an, an increasingly automated home environment, but that's in our view that's still probably a few to several years away. Uh, but it is something that will be increasingly enabled by 5G, uh, and especially will sort of in-house the, the internal in-home environment, and then providing the connectivity to the external world uh, on 5G as well. Uh, if we look at the business landscape. Um, we, we see a lot more use cases being used with, within a, a shorter framework of time um, across all verticals effectively. And what we see on this slide is a summary of um, at the top of the timeline, different verticals. Uh, below the, the timeline um, are different applications or application groups, and that's from the basic connectivity. So again, enhan enhanced mobile broadband applications to IoT and real-time analytics, artificial intelligence, um, also augmented and, and virtual reality uh, users. And we already see a number of those being piloted, uh, particularly in the mining industry, agriculture industry in South Africa, starting to see its uh, first pilot implementations in the manufacturing space. Uh, that speaks to manuf manufacturing process automation um, so a lot of the, the initial application piloting is taking place in the IoT space and then um, real-time analytics using that data as quickly as possible to convert it into useful information that can then um, drive manufacturing process automation or efficiencies within an organization. Um, if, if we look at the financial sector, for instance, there, there's going to be growing reliability on analytics and also real-time analytics and artificial intelligence across practically all the, the bank, banking and financial products. And in time also increasing use of um, augmented and uh, or virtual reality effectively for uh, more, more efficient distance interaction with the customer base. And one of the, I suppose the uh, characteristics of the South African users consumers is that they are a bit shy in the use of virtual reality and, and augmented reality uh, products as well. And we've seen it from other research we, we conducted recently at the end of 2020, uh, looking at the hosted contact center environment, for instance, uh, that's expected to change uh, with the new millennial generation becoming growing and then becoming 
uh, greater commercial users of various services as they move into increasingly into the workforce and, and uh, make use of, of financial products and other products, buy more services. Um, so that, that will change, but that's uh, one of the reasons for seeing the VR, AR um, use cases being further off into the future in terms of um, greater uh, uptake or economies of scale in, in that particular use case. Uh, so one point to keep in mind is uh, that the, this timeline represents our view of more large scale deployments where we start seeing economies of scale maybe come to, come to the fore uh, rather than just initial uh, uses of these an uptake of these use cases because a lot of these already are being piloted and, and we see initial deployments but um, large scale deployments um, are going to take obviously take place a bit later um, in the automotive sector that uh, that speaks to the uh, autonomous vehicle type scenario rather than manufacturing so when we look at manufacturing of vehicles in south africa that, that's in the manufacturing sector that's going to start making use of um, IoT using 5G technologies uh, a lot quicker, but um, autonomous vehicles um, are going to, are still probably several years away, at least in, in South Africa. And um, I think other, that, you know, a lot of these applications ultimately will require high speed, high data throughput, low latency uh, scenarios, which means uh, effectively in all of these uh, move of the edge closer to the user. Um, so that's, that's another um, whole scenario in, in the 5G environment where we're going to start uh, seeing the shift of the edge. Um, smart computing, edge computing move increasingly more towards the, the access network um, where we can achieve you know, turnaround speeds and latency of 20 milliseconds and less than even 5 milliseconds in, in, in some of these applications. So the automotive sectors, I think, still is a, a bit of a way off. Apart from the infrastructure, ICT infrastructure required to be put in place, uh, which can take place relatively quickly, uh, we, we, there's other infrastructure that, that needs upgrading thing in South Africa, such as road infrastructure, uh, often power grid upgrades re uh, required for stable power supply in order to realize some of these uh, external environments, so the, co the commercials, uh, say the, the external uh, network environment uh, use case scenarios. We are going to see um, probably a lot quicker deployment of these of, of many of these uh, use cases within uh, the um, organizational or enterprise environment. So that that effectively translates into private five G networks on premises versus um, outside of the, the enterprise premises. Uh, infrastructure and and that's a lot more contained environment and obviously can be managed a lot better um, and is going to all, all of these use cases are ultimately going to start resulting in greater efficiencies uh, cost optimization cost reductions in, in terms of uh, capex in some instances but also uh, more I think importantly over time opex uh, improved product quality and and so forth. Um, so what's, what we start seeing globally in terms of um, autom a great, uh, greatly automated environment in many of the verticals is going to arrive in South Africa over the next, uh, probably starting in a, in a couple of years from now, over the next few to several years to far greater extent. Um, and ultimately that speaks to where the, the 5G based economy is going to go. Um, as, as we see implementation of, of 5G uh, as an underpinning delivery mechanism, delivering infrastructure for uh, the, the, the business use cases, and then also uh, uptake of those services in the um, consumer environment for uh, not only for leisure purposes, but also more importantly for social economic purposes. So ability to interact to a far greater extent economically in the economy, not only in South Africa, but globally, um, because the, the, despite uh, various, um, let's say more conservative, conservative scenarios globally, we, we are continuing to become a global village. And then also to access the, the social services such as education and health services, which will ultimately be a great equalizer in the society in terms of ability to to gain quality education and quality health services.
So um, that's our view of the 5G market um, evolution over the next several years uh, in South Africa specifically. As indicated, we, we are waiting to see um, how the high demand spectrum auction is going to progress. Hopefully news will start be, become available over the next few weeks. Um, and then we'll be able to update the reports to, to have a, a better informed view of the likely growth of this market going forward. Um, once the, the auction timeline has been confirmed. Um, any questions, I suppose, as indicated, either in the, in the, in the chat line or you can also field them to us directly on, our, on my contact details and we'll be more than happy to engage with you and ask any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for being an attentive audience. Thank you, Juanita. Thanks, Dobek. Thank you very much. Um, I see that there are two questions already posted for you, but I think for the sake of time, um, if you can uh, maybe type up in the Q&A box uh, that you'll have access to and just try and answer them, um, then that would be a great help. Um, so thank you very much, Dobek. Very informative, um, as always. Much appreciated. Um, but um, it gives me a great pleasure to go to somebody else um, that we have dealt with extensively in the past. Many of you that have attended our previous conferences have uh, met Rolf um, or at least some of his colleagues. Um, I came to know Rolf um, a couple of years ago um, in my dealings with the FTTH Council Europe, um, where Rolf is sort of the, uh, the go-to for all things fiber and 5G. Um, and um, he's uh, led uh, extensive um, research work for the FTTH Council Europe, uh, which became a global paper. Um, for many of you have seen uh, some of the work that we've delivered um, as a part of our global position on the role of fiber in, in achieving 5G networks. Um, and um, Ralph has been instrumental in, in leading a team of researchers in understanding, you know, what it sort of means, you know, where does fiber end and, and 5G start, um, you know, looking at small cells identification um, and exactly what sort of uh, fiber requirements uh, are going to be needed to achieve our, our 5G goals um, in, um, in other parts of the world. So um, everybody, Ralph is the CEO um, and the co-owner of a, a company called Comsoft, which is a software company. Um, and uh, they do extensive work in uh, software to automate the planning and design of fiber optic networks. Um, but yeah, please visit his website, uh, Comsoft. Uh, Risha will also post his contact details. Um, Ralph, over to you. Thank you very much for your time. Yes, thank you very much, Juanita, for your uh, kind introduction and uh, uh, invitation to today to, to bring you some uh, information about our, our story on FTTH and 5G. And well, uh, let me also introduce my colleague, uh, Kelly Fournier, who, who will help me today through uh, our story, because we have a lot to share and uh, hopefully it will be a bit more uh, yeah, pleasant with some interaction. So Kelly is our head of uh, sales and marketing. Um, he's uh, joined us more than a little bit more than a year ago. But the, the very good thing uh, about that is that he also has an extensive uh, background into real yeah, fiber deployments and, and projects on the telecom side uh, with many operators on the operator side. So bringing in a lot of, of uh, hands on uh, uh, experience. Um, so uh, yeah, Kelly. Uh, Maybe over to you. Yeah, thanks, Raf. Uh, again, just like to reiterate um, uh, a special thanks to Digital Council Africa for this invitation. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, hopefully, one day we'll get back to these live events um, and we can actually meet each other in person. Uh, these uh, we can see here nice pictures. We were kidding about this this morning, Raf and I. Maybe we should put pictures with masks on now. Uh, because people uh, don't even recognize our full faces anymore. But uh, kidding aside, um, Raf and I are taking this uh, webinar chance to have a conversational approach to the subject. Um, and uh, having said that, hopefully we'll, we'll provide you with some interesting insight on FTTH and 5G. Um, through this conversational approach, of course, we're giving you also um, a chance to um, also communicate with us through an online polling uh, system through the, um, through the presentation. So if you want, you can use your smartphones, smart devices, 
uh, or even go directly on your computer, type in the, the, the link and uh, you will be getting throughout the presentation some, some interesting questions, uh, interesting for, for us also to, to know who we're talking to and know a uh, level of experience with our subject and also good for the audience to, to see. Uh, so we can start with the first one. Uh, we'd like to know what type of company you work for. So, of course, in the space of 5G, FTTX or FTTH, uh, we assume uh, these companies, network operators, consultancy firms, of course, engineering, uh, build contractors. You can be part of a municipality, regulatory uh, body, government, uh, or maybe a, a manufacturer of software equipment, passive or, or active, um, or you work for another company. So results starting to come in. We can see, okay, uh, so far, a lot of operators, which is very interesting. Um, and oh, surprisingly, um, I don't know what you think, Raf, but surprisingly more in the other, I would have thought we would have a little more engineering build and consultancy firm. So it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm a bit curious what the others are. So maybe people can also share on chat uh, what type of company uh, we missed in our, uh, in our categories. But overall, a nice spread, it seems, uh, a diverse audience. Should make for, for some interesting Q&A maybe later on. Excellent. So I think this would be the final look. Uh, if we go on to the next question, we have a question where we're interested to know uh, where you are in the 5G space, right? So we want to know uh, in this graph, you can position yourself. Uh, the X axis is your level of knowledge on the technical details of 5G. Uh, so the more you go to the right, the more um, the more you have this technical knowledge. And the Y axis is from the financial part, the business case part of 5G. So uh, again, uh, please go in and put your positioning just to see how um, how comfortable you are. Of course, it's completely anonymous. So if you want to go to the complete left or and bottom, uh, you're free to do so. We will not be able to post your name or where you are from. Um, so feel free for that. We can see that so far, um, most of the attendees are, are within the same quadrant, I would say. Um, seems to be an expert audience. Yeah, it gives a little more pressure huh, to us. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Very interesting. Okay, we have some that are a little bit more to the left, which is fine, of course. Um, I would assume if I would work for a regulatory body, for example, I may not have the same technical details of the 5G than somebody works at an operator, for example. So, of course, that is uh, completely justified. Yeah. And, and at the same time, yeah, a bit of a spread, but, but uh, definitely we'll try to uh, cover quite a lot of, of technical aspects uh, in our rest of our presentation on the 5G part. So I would say for a uh, yeah, majority of the people, hopefully there is some, uh, some interesting stuff there that may get you more to the right, especially. And that's our expertise where we hope to contribute. Indeed. Okay. Very good. Yeah, so moving on. Um, so thanks, we, we now have a better idea of, of the attendees. Um, so why are we talking about convergence here? Um, so maybe we start off uh, with a little bit of, a little bit of information. Uh, a lot has been already covered by Dobik, so that's, that's quite good. Um, moving to the um, 5G use cases, we already talked about that one. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it. This is a um, we could say has now become a famous uh, schematic of a, a source from the ITU uh, for 5G uh, use cases. Uh, maybe a wink out uh, to the health services that will probably be, uh, you know, post pandemic, one of the use cases that, that is really um, uh, jumping out as, as something that will probably be um, uh, powerful 5G use cases in the future. Um, so we wanted to give a, a shout out to the health system, I'm sure, um, whether it's uh, in Europe or in South Africa or the rest of the African continent, this will probably be the case. Now, 5G, the conversation of 5G is, uh, of course, uh, really goes around spectrum. 
Um, now we, we would, you know, wonder why fiber convergence is a story now with 5G and why wasn't it a subject with 4G, uh, considering that even myself have been part of major projects uh, to build uh, fiber backhauling to 4G cell sites. Well, essentially, it's the same story, but uh, we could say it's the same, same story put on steroids, if you will, uh, because, you know, 5G expands into a much broader range of spectrum. Um, and particularly, you know, because of the growing amount of bandwidth and low latency requirements. Um, so you, you can see today 5G deployments, even in Europe, uh, they focus on, you know, a sub six gigahertz bandwidth, a bandwidth. And it's not that much different from 4G, but in the coming future, as the stages of 5G develop, um, we know that you know, higher frequencies will be needed. And um, only with these high frequencies can you meet, and this was already discussed by DBEC, uh, can you meet the, the bandwidth and low latency requirements? So we're talking about you know, going upwards of uh, 2,400 megahertz, 2,600, and even 60 gigahertz, um, which will uh, likely be the, the spectrum used for 5G. So essentially, there is an impact on the wireless network for this uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of coverage, for sure. Speaking of those impacts, uh, Rav, how, how would you describe those impacts and, and, and what, what the, the use of these higher spectrums would, would do in terms of coverage? Yeah, well, um, it's, it's true eh, that there's more spectrum, there's more possibilities in 5G, but uh, I always like to refer to this law of conservation of hassle. Uh, it's, a, it's a law I've been uh, referring to also to my children and my, uh, even my mother for several uh, decades already, because it's something you always come, uh, come across. For example, uh, to give you an, a recognizable example from daily life, when uh, you used to have a printer uh, at, at home and you would connect it with all wires to your PC. Uh, a lot of hassle with the wires, but typically it would print pretty nice. Now, uh, when I bought a new printer uh, a year ago, no, no more wires needed, everything wireless. Okay, so we'll get rid of the hassle with the, with the cables, but I can assure you the hassle comes back on the other side uh, somewhere, and in this case, to get it on the, on the Wi-Fi network and get it to do what I want to do. Uh, it, so it always comes back. And, and if you then look at the 5G, yes, more uh, capabilities, more applications, uh, more uh, frequency to be used, all good, but the hassle will come from another side. And, and I think this is nicely illustrated here that uh, one of those impacts when we move up in the in the spectrum and in the frequencies is especially on the coverage you can reach from a certain cell site so um, you see here um, a nice real uh, simulation of, of signal propagation from a certain cell on five gigahertz uh, with typical uh, powering uh, settings and you see uh, how it also nicely covers a quite a long range especially uh, between the buildings, uh, between the, the uh, along a street, if the if the site is well positioned, if you do the same with a 60 gigahertz, uh, just for illustration, you see that you get a lot, uh, yeah, a lot less far uh, for in reach, and that's where indeed this this whole um, yeah connection also with the hassle coming in the densification, you're gonna have to uh, introduce much more cells to reach a, a decent coverage uh, with, uh, with the growing frequency. Um, so that's where the hassle will, uh, will beat us back. Indeed, um, that's, that's quite an impactful uh, illustration I always find when I see that. Um, and, and having said that, I think it's, it's clear that you know, 5G and fiber, um, you know, they, they, they go hand in hand. Uh, we have to consider them as uh, in the same team. We've seen it with the limitations of microwave uh, 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 backhauling for 4G sites. Uh, 5G will require fiber. Um, and from a business case perspective, uh, you know, we should assume um, that it, it, uh, it makes sense to, um, to build the fiber now and consider the future of the fiber requirements for 5G and other type of service demands. But of course, let's not assume. 
Um, so we talk about fiber. Uh, we know that in the stages, we're going to need some densification. The number of sites will multiply uh, because of, of what you just explained, Raf. Uh, so that means more fiber and resulting in uh, really looking into the convergence and why should we build these, these, um, these networks uh, at one time or at least plan them at the same time. Um, and again, going back to my comment on assumption, let's not assume uh, that this is the way to go. Let's look at that uh, study more in, in detail. Mm -hmm. So when we say we want fiber, we need fiber, but how much fiber, right? Uh, maybe that's the magic question. Unfortunately, there is no straight cut answer. Um, the only answer we could give is, uh, yeah, we need a lot. We need a lot. And unfortunately, apologies to everyone if you were looking for a more accurate number. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very difficult to, to give because it depends on so many different uh, elements. And these are the elements uh, a little bit that we'll go into details. And we'll see in the study that's um, uh, provided and where RAF will give more uh, information on. So thinking that we need a lot, then yeah, moving on to the study, let's just think about deploying um, the fiber uh, at once, looking at FTTH and 5G together, see, see what the impacts of doing that or not doing that, uh, that it has on the finances of a, of a network, considering as well that your, your TCO is not for the next year. It's looking at the years to come as it was explained in the previous presentation, where we're not looking at 5G just for 2022, we're looking at it for um, many years to come. So uh, Raf, um, good time for you to, to pick up the story and, and go into further details. Yes, indeed. Um, that, that's where yeah, our study work over the past two, two and a half years, I would say, uh, that Juanita also referred to uh, and that we did uh, as part of the DNO committee and of the Fiber to the Home uh, Council or even the Global Alliance, uh, really provide, try to provide some answers to, to some of these questions. Um, we, we asked ourselves at the beginning of the study a couple of years ago, like, okay, what would be really this cell densification? Uh, what, was it, what will it mean? What, what is the factor really that we can expect? And how will that um, impact the need for fiber uh, geographically as well? Um, what is the difference between the rural cases and the urban cases? That, that's obviously very different. And it actually also relates a little bit um, as a side remark to the, to the question whether um, FTTH, we talk now about convergence between FTTH and, and the fiber for 5G. I saw a question coming up during Dobek's uh, presentation as well, it, but is it not uh, one or the other? Um, I believe there will be cases um, in certain circumstances on a medium term where a fixed wireless access solution based on 5G could be some kind of an alternative, a broadband alternative, um, but needing the fiber for sure, if you wanna really bring a broadband service to, to a home. Um, but at the same time, I believe over the longer term and especially also in dense areas, um, it, it's typically what you see that uh, in the end, when there is a, a high need for bandwidth and a high usage, um, offloading that from the wireless network is always the, the ultimate and most efficient and best network move. Uh, because of course also the, the frequencies, the, the mobile network is a shared medium and you can't serve everybody with a high bandwidth um, across uh, the, the wireless spectrum. So you have to mix both. And that's why I'm a strong believer of those two technologies, fiber to the home and, and fiber or 5G uh, are compatible in the end and will live next to each other. And they both of course, uh, rely, like you, you said, on a lot of fiber. Uh, and that's where we see opportunities in the market to, uh, to take the benefits out of that. So that's what we will uh, look at and, and try to answer in a couple of cases. Um, how much fiber for this 5G future and, and how, can we, how much cost can we actually save uh, through uh, looking at these technologies together? So we, we've seen this uh, picture, I'm pulling it up because um, to just uh, show you, uh, also linking to Dobek's uh, presentation on uh, the current uh, 5G deployments, our study out of these spectrums, we looked at um, two frequencies, uh, 3.5 gigahertz and 26 gigahertz. Um, 
as, as the frequencies on which we would actually calculate and then look at what cell densification is. Um, we know, and I fully agree with, with the analysis, that in the next two, three, four years, most of the 5G deployment will probably be in that 3.5 and maybe uh, 700 megahertz. Uh, but um, there is already uh, some uh, countries and some cases where a millimeter wave is being deployed as well. And, and there is certainly uh, a use case in certain uh, circumstances, especially also the urban cases. Uh, but, but again, yeah, the time horizon that we're looking at for convergence between fiber and 5G uh, obliges us to look much further than that two or three years. Because if you deploy fiber, it's for decades to be there. And so you want to do it right, dig once and, and put in the necessary fiber also for the next uh, 10 to 20 years. And Especially, Rap, uh, when you consider the, the cost of your materials that you're taking, um, when you buy them from your material vendors, usually they have a material warranty of 25 years, right? We know their lifespan can go beyond. Look at copper, right? Yes. So unless you, unless you have, uh, you know, a fiber cut or an accident that happens on your network, you're, you should calculate that for at least 25 years, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's why even the, I, the 26 gigahertz may not be really from a business perspective on the horizon yet of, of many operators, but for, the, for that fiber life cycle, we believe it's, it's good to look ahead and, 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 and I imagine what will be the need in maybe beyond five years from now uh, and see if, if you can anticipate that or at least how to be uh, trying to be ready at a low cost uh, when you deploy fiber today. Um, because who knows what's coming actually in 10 years from now. Eh? The, I know uh, our, our friends at the uh, university, they don't talk about 5G, they talk about, about 6G to me. So what, what's coming next? Okay, so um, I want to make sure that there's some clarity about um, the, the assumptions and the model that we used in this study. Um, because of I, what, what our idea was, we don't want to just put up some numbers coming out of the blue. We really want to build um, a model and, and report on numbers that are very reliable. Um, and what we found out is we, we were actually able to really calculate some very nice uh, numbers, real use cases. We are very sure that the numbers coming out are very accurate and realistic, but the debate is always about the assumptions. And we took some assumptions with some uh, examples, and you may have different uh, view on, on assumptions that would go for your case. But actually, the good thing is, in our model, we can just adjust those assumptions, uh, adjust the assumptions to your case, and see what would come out of your uh, of your uh, your own uh, use case. So the model we used is a combination of an uh, a wireless propagation model and a an, um, fixed line uh, calculation model. So uh, we basically uh, use a 5G propagation model that is um, where, we, where we work together with a partner of us uh, called Cyrodiil. Uh, they have, an, um, they have yeah, an, an, a detailed mathematical model that will show you how far you can reach from a certain um, site. And we populate that with all the assumptions on the 5G network. And then we bring the selected sites for a certain 5G coverage um, into uh, the FTTX model, which, which is where our software comes in. And that will actually calculate a fiber to the home or a fiber to the antenna or a fiber to a converged fiber network uh, and compare the costs of all those scenarios. So um, looking at... Um, Looking at the areas, uh, we applied these calculations, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, as well on an urban as on a rural and, and something in between, because we really wanted to see the impact of, of density uh, on, the, on the results. So we, we really took real areas. Of course, there's, again, a lot of variation possible, but they are real areas. Um, we were able to uh, get a hold of, of real 3D LiDAR data for all these areas. Why is that important? Because that LiDAR data, it's a, it's a 3D world like you know from Google Street View, 
but it's where you can really do those propagations on uh, really considering all the obstacles that are available uh, or present in the street so that you can really uh, come up with, with realistic coverage uh, numbers. And we assumed uh, all the lampposts in a certain area to be candidates for a small cell 5G network um, as an, a discrete set of options. And you see here the dense area where you see the 3D building data and you see the, the lamppost as potential cell sites. And then um, we created, in this case, starting uh, nine scenarios, three in each type of density area, where uh, each scenario is also uh, a different level of density for the, for the cells. Um, just to highlight a few important things. So you see in the low cell density, we mainly focus on 3.5 gigahertz. And we try to reach 100% coverage in those areas for 3.5 gigahertz. In the high cell density area within a, a dense city, a, a city center, um, we would actually already look also at uh, introducing the microwave. So this is probably a scenario that is quite far into the future. If you look at the rural area, there we even don't look at 26 gigahertz because we don't yet see really a, a business case on it. So those scenarios are focused on 3.5 gigahertz with the low 70% uh, and the high targeting 100% coverage in that rural area for 3.5 gigahertz. So you see linking to the, to the spectrums that are being used. There's different assumptions. You may not believe today in a 26 gigahertz. Well, then maybe the, the city center top right is maybe too ambitious for you. But um, yeah, there's, there's a wide variety of settings we've, uh, we've used. Um, and also important, um, what I like to highlight, one of the problems that I see with, with uh, higher frequency that, that is also important to mention is the indoor coverage. The higher the frequency, the more a wall or even a window becomes an obstacle for the signal and it, uh, I, the, the quality uh, goes down very quickly. So when you even to 3.5 gigahertz, uh, you will see if you want to use it for indoor coverage that you will need densification to reach a decent indoor coverage. So that is also important. Actually, Raf, uh, not to slow you down because you're on a good pace, but um... We, we look at these uh, uh, different scenarios and I relate back to the presentation just before us uh, in the webinar. And Jovic mentioned um, a timeline uh, for a densification or a, a sort of relative timeline. I was wondering what was your take on that timeline versus the scenarios and maybe the density areas. So urban, suburban, rural, maybe whether it's from a European perspective, do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the thing really in my mind is that, yeah, uh, when you hear uh, the coming two, three years, 5G deployments are being announced and coverages are being announced, but it's all, I think, going to be in into these, uh, well, a lot in this top left corner yeah. where you have high dense areas and you deploy it at 3.5 gigahertz and, and that's like a first phase. But uh, I've added here in the slides as well, from that, I think over time, when you would jump into uh, 10 years from now, it's going to be going through different phases and it's going to be a gradual extension of the spectrum, a gradual extension of the sites and of coverage. So you could see these different cell densities, definitely also for me as just phases in the rollout of 5G that are going to come. The question is when, is it going to take 10 years to be at the right side? Uh, but these are um, steps and the coming years, it's I think going to be on the on the left-hand side of this graph in terms of scenarios. But um, yeah, that's not going to be the end game. Yeah. Um, I won't go into the details of this because that is real yeah, expert work from our technical teams um, to see what assumptions we take. Again, if, if you would have different assumptions on 5G deployment at 3.5 gigahertz, you could update them and, and use them in the model. Um, the, the key thing, I guess, um, to look at here uh, with these assumptions is that our 3.5 gigahertz um, deployment with the given power ranges and uh, also the, the, well, actually the, the um, uh, 
the, the, sig uh, the signal to interference plus noise ratio uh, numbers that are quoted here uh, would actually deliver a quality of something like 15 to 30 megabits per second, um, which is a nice, uh, of course, quality of speed, but of course, nothing compared with the high bandwidth that you could get through a fiber network. And just as a, as a reference, um, if you look at our 26 gigahertz deployment, there we would be going up to 191 megabits per second um, spectrum uh, or, or bandwidth, but again, shared. So it's, uh, if, if you are with a lot of users at the same time in the same sector, you're gonna have to share that uh, bandwidth. Okay, let's maybe do a quick poll. Um, yeah. Indeed, um, interesting to know what your thoughts are on the number of cell sites that you think uh, will be there in five years as opposed to today. So what do you think the multiplication factor will be uh, today and versus five years of the number of cell sites? So interesting to know the, the, um, the view of our attendees. We're already seeing some numbers come in. Uh, interesting to see that already the times 30 is, seems to be the popular answer here. So I think going towards densification um, quite relatively quickly, if we, we think about it, five years is, is not that far off. Eh? The, the older we get, the, the, the faster time seems to go. Um, so yeah, that's yeah. very interesting. Yes, and, and well, I've done some of these polls uh, across several yeah, events, even in, in several continents. And I would say, yeah, this, this is definitely a trend that you see across all continents and countries, this anticipation and belief of, of this cell densification. So it's good to see uh, that that's uh, in our audience here today as well, very strongly uh, available. So uh, I want to show you now one, one uh, detailed example of, of one of our uh, areas and, and under the assumption that I was mentioning uh, to, to show you what a real densification factor looks like across our scenarios. So here is this city center, uh, city center area. And today we have, uh, this is the real uh, information actually, we have six macro sites for 4G, uh, which are deployed and spread across this, um, this uh, yeah, neighborhood, you could say. Um, and as we said, stage one of a 5G deployment is uh, very likely, could be uh, deploying 3.5 gigahertz 5G uh, from those micro sites. So no cell densification, we have a 5G deployment, but if we um, actually, um, look at the um, coverage and the propagation from these macro sites at 3.5 gigahertz in this detailed, uh, detailed model based on the 3D data, we actually see that there are islands where the coverage is not uh, good enough. So to reach a real 100% coverage, you see on the map, we need to introduce some um, of these small cells, eh? so the bigger circles are the macro cells, but we introduce some small cells to fill the gaps. Um, and um, to reach 100% coverage, we see that we introduce 11 small cells in a, in a second stage, you could say, of 5G deployment um, to reach um, this, um, this, this coverage. So we are talking about a factor three in a relatively yeah, it's a close timeline um, to, to reach a decent coverage with 3.5 gigahertz. Um, in this dense area, what we also saw as, as a realistic case is that we have a train station, we have a shopping mall, we have all kinds of public places where we expect a lot of people to be um, yeah, using mobile services, but also uh, they are indoor and we know indoor coverage is not as ideal. So one, one of the uh, ways to reach a very good service as an operator uh, in this type of area would be to install also some indoor hotspots uh, with the 5G so people can just use the 5G technology on their mobile phone if they have it in their device and get the best possible service also in those public places uh, with a lot of crowds. Going up to a factor five, uh, introducing 13 uh, of those public hotspots. And this is what we refer to as our low cell densification um, scenario. Um, then you see introducing 26 gigahertz um, 
even to reach 50% coverage, you see the blue small cells popping up, which will fill in the gaps again that we would have when we deploy the 26 gigahertz from the, the former small cells of 3.5. Uh, we need to add actually extra blue ones, even to reach 50% coverage. So you see, we were coming to a densification factor of around 10. And then the final one uh, with a target of 80, oh, sorry, 95% coverage uh, of 26 gigahertz next to the 3.5 gigahertz, um, actually resulting in uh, almost 120 uh, cell sites uh, needed. Again, very future. Um, oriented uh, scenario, not really in scope in a lot of countries within the next couple of years, uh, but nevertheless, interesting to see how it could evolve over long term. So um, that's uh, on the wireless side where you see these factors that out of the poll came up as well, the factor 10, the factor 30. Yes, they are certainly also realistic when you look at the technology requirements. And, and to reach uh, decent uh, coverages. Um, so out of this, on the map you saw, we identified the cell sites. Um, as I mentioned, we would now bring those cell sites onto the map as demand points for fiber. And we wanna connect them to fiber uh, because we know there's also gonna be a lot of uh, traffic offloading needed. Um, and on top of that, we also add all the homes, all the individual residential users of broadband that could, could get a uh, fiber connection. You see some assumptions here, uh, what type of fiber network we are going to deploy, how many fibers are needed. Again, a lot of assumptions, um, which could be different case by case or could be tuned depending on the, the operator or the country. Um, and we put all of this data into our um, fiber design module, our, our software, that will actually automatically calculate a realistic uh, FTDX network on top of the street uh, information, uh, where you see a, a screenshot, and it will calculate the, the total cost uh, for this network. And if we do that, then we can actually get to some uh, conclusions. Well, uh, before I do that, very important as well, Apart from the type of network, it's also crucial to see what are the unit costs. Now, these parameters here is what, what is being used in the, in the European uh, study. Uh, there are 80 euro for a dense area on average for trenching, uh, 50 and 35 uh, as, as the, the type of soils uh, become more accessible. Um, but obviously, if you would change these uh, to, to a local prices that may differ, uh, the conclusions, of course, will also be uh, different. This is uh, important to mention. Uh, and also all our uh, costs that we are reporting, they focus on the outside plant passive fiber infrastructure. So they don't include costs for active equipment uh, on the 5G or uh, on the home or FTTH uh, side. So um, you see here uh, a bit of a zoom to a street level where you see the cables, uh, the colored lines are cables that would be deployed for fiber to the home. Uh, and you see that yeah, you're uh, virtually deploying cables in every street, on every side of the street, even if, if it's a dense area. So of course, there's a lot of infrastructure being deployed here. And then if you look at what the 5G needs, uh, obviously it also needs fiber in a lot of these streets to connect all these cell sites, whether it's uh, the low density or the high density scenario, um, there is a lot of uh, yeah, cable deployment throughout that city. And that's where logically up front, you know, um, if you would put those two networks on top of each other, uh, you would actually be able to reuse a lot of the trenches and the ducts um, in the same part of the, of the network and benefit from uh, this from a cost perspective. From a business case perspective as well, you're actually extending that the, the initial fixed cost, uh, putting overlaying them on both technologies, or we say both, I should say all types of service demands. So if the business case is calculated overlaying all these types of service demands, then it gives a better overall business case, of course. It absolutely. should be. Yeah, absolutely. And and to be honest, this is looking at uh, FTTH and 5G, but, but enterprise is, is another layer you can perfectly put on top. So uh, if you can plan one network for all, 
yeah, you're going to save hugely uh, by spending only one time the, the infrastructure cost. Uh, so let's let's look at the results, um, the, the results of, of these calculations. Uh, you, you saw eh, for the dense area, we were looking at a factor 5 to 20 in our scenarios of, of cell densification. As I mentioned, this could be a, a, a a uh, gradual rollout, a timeline um, over which we are deploying. And, and just to give you the result on rural, uh, you see here for uh, 3.5 gigahertz only in this uh, real example, starting from two macro sites, we needed to go to 16 sites uh, in order to get a decent uh, uh, coverage also indoor uh, in this region. So you see this is now, for example, going from a factor two to eight, also on the rural case. Um, so it's it's with different numbers, but there's a similar a similar need and a similar evolution in the network. Uh, here you see the detailed uh, yeah, propagation outcome, uh, which is obviously uh, uh, based on the real data again and, and detailed uh, analysis. And um, then on the real uh, numbers, we calculate the cost for the fiber to the home network standalone. We calculate the cost for a 5G fiber network, a fiber to the 5G. On top of that, like I mentioned, there's cost for spectrum, there's cost for active devices, which we currently, and that's the question mark bar, we don't talk about that. We, we don't consider those. They, for a full business case, they would need to be added. Uh, but here we are looking at the part of the fiber which is actually, uh, if you build those two networks separately, you would have to stack those costs on top of each other um, as a total investment, possibly also spread over time. But if you would do one network, as we mentioned, you can lower that total cost. And so um, the, the, the question we have a bit, and then we have one, uh, one poll on that, uh, is how much of that green bar of the fiber to 5G how, which percentage of that green bar do you think you can eliminate by using that convergence uh, as a means? Yeah, this is going to be interesting as well, because from my experience, I see that a lot of operators around the world are still built based on the type of service demand, right? So the business entity yes. for key accounts, they have their own budget, and then you have the wireless guys have their own budget, and, and the FTTH fixed guys have the same uh, uh, their own budget, and you see a lot of the capex, initial capex, being put on the FTTH rollout and other type of service demands. Um, I don't want to say piggybacking on that network, but essentially using some of that network and existing infrastructure um, to to cover the the, the wireless backhauling uh, demands. And in the case of five G, will be front hauling likely demands. So interested to see these numbers. Um, yes, indeed. Indeed, um, it's indeed looks that the audience believes it's more, yeah, I would say on average, probably, yeah, okay, around the 20, 30% mark on, on average, according to the audience. So let, let's look at the real number. Um, so these are the real costs that we calculate, again, based on the assumptions, the fiber to the home, 8.5 million uh, as an investment uh, euros, the fiber to 5G, 1.85 million. So if you stack them on top, and you compare it to the one network fits all uh, deployed in one shot, uh, you actually see that it's only 9 million. And in other words, we were able to save 74% of that fiber to 5G um, by convergence. And if that is a, a benefit you attribute to the 5G business case, it's gonna make a huge difference in the, in the on the cost side, of course. Um, or you could distribute that benefit across the fiber to the home and the 5G business case as well. Uh, that is uh, up to, to an operator to see how, how they use that convergence uh, for their business. And then without going into too much details, given the, the time, um, we have all these results. So you can see uh, a low dense uh, cell. So the 3.5 gigahertz scenario, you would actually uh, save even much more because it, it's able to fit in uh, even uh, better into each other. Uh, but also interesting on the low dense area, there is also a significant saving. So this convergence story applies uh, okay, with some different numbers, but applies equally to a high dense area as to a low dense area. Um, and then we did another simulation here 
with an aerial network instead of an underground network, which is obviously also used uh, frequently and, and depending on the area. Uh, and of course, that gives, again, another number. In, in this case, the 83 goes to 42% saving. So again, the assumptions are crucial. Your type of network will determine what, what number really goes for your case. But still, the conclusion of the study was really also above our expectation and I think above the, the audience expectation um, looking at the poll uh, results. I see we're uh, about through the time. I don't know if we can continue a little bit longer or whether we uh, should leave the... Because there's one more part of the study. I don't know, Juanita, whether you prefer whether we continue a bit or whether we just uh, leave the rest of the results for the audience to check in the slides? Um, Ralph, I think for the sake of time, maybe we um, leave the results for the audience, if that's okay with you. Yes, sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank of you. Course. Yeah, so, so people who would have questions in detail uh, also on the, on the, um, the next results, um, feel free to reach out to us. We are happy to, to provide more details, even if it's on a, in a one-on-one -on -one call. Great, thank you. And, and thanks very much for your time, Raf and Kelly, also for you coming in. Um, and um, yeah, it's really, really appreciated. And um, uh, it's uh, really great for us that we can always rely on, on your support and pull you into these very important conversations. Um, Risha, um, if you can just again post uh, both Kelly and Ralph's contact details um, and Ralph's contact details, it'll be it'll be great. And then of course the presentations will be shared um, post uh, the webinar. Um, it's very difficult to send it to everybody, and there's a lot of people that um, that join these events that we don't have your contact details. So we always um, prefer that you ask um, for the presentation. So please drop Risha an email. Risha Digital Council Africa. She's got access to the presentations, and um, and then of course you're also very welcome to engage with both Kelly as well as Rolf directly, um, and of course with Dobek. Um, and then um, any questions that you may have, um, you're welcome to just send it on to them. But um, yeah, on that note, thanks everyone, and thanks for joining us. We just uh, running two minutes over, and. Um, I hope um, you know you enjoyed the content, and we look forward to bringing you some uh, some more content in this regard um, throughout 2021 and the years we progress. But certainly a very interesting topic, and um, yeah, thank you, Raf. Have a great day. Thank in you, Brussels. as well. Brussels, I think Amsterdam, Brussels. Yeah, close to Brussels. <laughs> thank you, and, uh, Kelly. Uh, I think you're in the US. Um, have a great day. Um, also in, uh, in, in Belgium, so. Oh, okay, in Belgium. All right. Bye, Danke. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, have a good day. Thank you, Dobek. Um, everyone, have a great day and a good rest of the week. Take care. Bye. Bye.